had a, a PowerPoint presentation. It's pretty lengthy and I want to get through it. When I ran through it, it was an hour long and that's too long. Um, so I'm trying to keep my, my words and time under 40 minutes so that there'll be time for your questions and whatnot. But I want to talk about my little entry into gardening um, before I start our, our um, how-to class, if you will. I have been gardening really for all of my life. That's what reminded me of a quote I heard my granddaughter tell a friend one time that she had been gardening all her life. But anyway, um, I took a liking to gardening very early on. And one of the um, things that happened is in the 70s, there began to become a, bear, uh, a rage in houseplants and became very, very popular macrame holders and houseplants and all of that stuff. And um, I got hit with a bug of gardening. And once I had my first plant, then I was on a mission to learn everything there was about um, plants and house plants and how to take care of them. And, and I wanted to have one of each kind and, um, and there it goes. And then at a very young age of 21, I started my very own plant business. Um, and what my business was, was giving plant parties. I would go into people's homes that had brought in their neighbors and friends and family. And I'd bring my plants with me and we'd talk about the care and feeding of them. And then we'd talk about the plants and people would order plants. And then I would, you know, fill the orders. And it was really a lot of fun. And I can't believe at 21, I was already an entrepreneur and, and doing things, thinking of doing that now, looking at 21 year olds. I don't know. But anyway, that's how I got started into gardening. It was all about houseplants and I continue to have houseplants all over. I have some that are 50 years old. Um, we have a large floor plant, a ficus, that is 41 years old at least. I know that because we bought it on our honeymoon. <laughs> and um, and we still are taking care of that plant. So if you do care for your plants properly, um, you can enjoy them long term. And um, but then know that they do too have a lifetime like us. So um, you know, plants do come and go occasionally. But there are some plants that we nurture a little bit more. Um, before I get into that, I thought I'd talk about these two. Um, types of house plants that I just kind of brought together here for us. One is succulents and one is this beautiful orchid that just came into bloom. I hope you can see how pretty it is. Um, my question to you is, which one do you think um, would require more sunlight? Can somebody raise their hand if they have an answer? And then we'll unmute you. Have you got a hand, Carolyn? Uh, Jennifer is raising her hand. I am going to guess the orchid only because I have a succulent and it gets about zero sun and I've owned it for decades. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, sadly, I have to say your answer is wrong. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's what you get for throwing out questions, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for raising your hand. Now, actually, the succulents are the ones that need um, more sunlight than the, um, than the orchid. And here's why. When it comes to raising house plants and what their needs are, the, the quickest way to determine what their needs are is to try to find out where they came from. Succulents grow in desert areas, uh, very arid um, landscapes. It's uh, very hot, there's lots of sun, there's no shade. And succulents actually um, store water in their stems and in their leaves so that they can um, deal with droughts and whatnot if there's no, um, if there's a dry spell. So succulents need the sun more than they need the water. Um, and that is because, again, where they typically are grown in the world. Where orchids grow in tropical areas, usually in the uh, under canopy of trees, oftentimes you'll see them attached right on trees. And so the canopy of the trees actually shades them from the sunlight. Um, and I have actually a perfect example of that. This um, orchid had been outside during the summer 
and I was a little careless with it and it was too far in the sun. And I don't know if you can see it, but I have a sunburn leaf right in the crease, this little dark area. Um, I, you know, I didn't want to take the leaf off itself, but that is a sunburn because it got too much sunlight. So, um, and then I gave the second part of the answer. I was going to ask which required more water. Um, and of course, the orchid would, if you think about the forest or, and the, uh, the jungles, um, the tropical areas, you get frequent short water rains and then it clears up and you have lots of humidity around. So an orchid needs to have water that will, you know, go through, hit their roots, fall out, and then um, with that drainage, they've got time, you know, they can turn around and, and receive another rainfall um, very quickly. So orchids need more water than succulents because succulents store their um, water in their leaves and the orchids do not. They are looking for that continuous rainfall and, and overall um, heightened humidity to survive. So with that, I'm going to turn on and share my screen and um, talk to you in depth about how to take care of them. Okay, share and play. Okay, y'all can see the screen okay? Yes. I forgot, you're all on mute. <laughs> okay, we'll just keep moving on. Um, there we go. All right. So house plants that you can live with. As we just mentioned, indoor plants come from mostly tropical and subtropical areas of the world. Usually that filler space of 3000 miles north and south of the Ecuador, equator. Um, and as we just pointed out, um, knowing where your plant originated from um, and where it's native to will help you understand those growth requirements. And what can plants do for you? Well, first they can bring the outdoors indoors and nature is a very wonderful thing. It has healing properties. Um, it has a freshness to it. And um, it always just, it just adds to our, our pleasure of being able to bring the indoor, the outdoors inside. Of course, it's got aesthetic qualities. Um, you can use them in many um, ways in your home, uh, display them in, in very unusual ways. And being that my other hat is an interior designer, I'll be showing you lots of ways to incorporate these houseplants into your home. Um, it also enhances a sense of well-being. They say that gardening is all about the feeding the mind, body, and spirit, and um, having the responsibility for the care and feeding of, of a, a plant that is helpless and totally dependent on you um, really makes us feel like we are doing something very purposeful. And it's a satisfying hobby. Um, looking at houseplants is not why we have houseplants. We have houseplants um, for the aesthetics, for the sense of well-being, um, for the bringing nature in, but it also, um, with that, we're potting, we're cutting, we're trimming, we're watching new buds grow, we're watching it flower, um, we're, we're taking care of it if it gets any illnesses or any pests. So um, it can be very time consuming and that's okay. Um, if that's that's what you choose to do for a hobby. And most importantly, especially now in our time of being um, locked down, it's plants provide um, the opportunity to clean our air. They actually are um, air filtering. Now, why did I move this slide up to this place? I'm going to talk about this peace lily. On the left side, you see it just used very nicely placed on a, on a tabletop and, and nicely displayed. It's in a very pretty bowl or pot, I should say. Um, a peace lily plant is one of the easiest plants you can care for um, in the world of house plants because it doesn't often need a lot of light. Um, it does need a lot of water, but that's easy enough to give to it. And it's free flowering. And um, I'm showing this picture on the right because it is a picture that my granddaughter sent me. She's 23. She's in her new apartment. And um, for her new apartment, I gave her 
a peace lily plant. And of course she got a lesson in how to take care of it and whatnot. Um, but she texted me on Saturday and with exclamation marks for her text to show me that it's giving forth a baby. And I know that I have unleashed the passion for gardening in my granddaughter now. And um, I have a second plant to give her, but she's hooked. <laughs> Here's a look at some um, house plants that do purify the air. You've got a couple of ferns there. Number one and three is a fern. You've got that mother's law tongue in the middle that is hard to kill. I mean, you could live, that could live in a dark corner and be just fine. Your spider plant, uh, the peace lily again, and then your, um, your mums. In 1989, um, as we were getting ready to take a trip afar, um, NASA included a research project of studying houseplants and um, their impact on air pollution. That's not mine, is it? No, <laughs> no, I turned mine off. Okay, um, anyway, so NASA, NASA had this study and they took common houseplants aboard the spacecraft, some of the ones that you saw on the previous screen. And what they discovered is that they eliminated toxins such as benzene, formaldehyde, Tulane. And not only did they discover that it cleansed the air of those toxins that I'm sure they had a lot of in that um, spaceship, um, but it also removed the odors. And you can imagine how odiferous a space capsule could be with three or four um, astronauts aboard. So um, it was a real mind, mind shocking um, revelation that they really did have great benefits for our home. And this is just a picture of the cover of the report. Very easy to find it out online if you wanna study it any further. Some, in, um, some plants that are good for um, cleaning your air are plants such as aloe vera, the Boston fern, the spider plant, the Diefenbachia, pothos, ficus, um, really all plants do it, but these are more common, easier to grow plants. Rule of thumb, you want to allow one house plant per 100 square feet um, if you want it to actually do the work of cleansing the um, the living area. Now that if you take a 10 by 10 room, that would be 100 square feet. And um, the only other thing I want to point out is, is that it doesn't do much to elevate or alleviate um, tobacco smoke. But I have a story about that too. My granddaughter's other grandma passed away and she was a very heavy smoker. And so my granddaughter came to me with a fern or excuse me, a palm um, that her grandmother had cared for for years and asked me to um, take care of it um, because it had been, you know, a little, little um, ignored while her grandmother was sick and that she really, really wanted to keep this plant. So I took it and it had an awful tobacco odor. It just smelled like cigarettes. So the first thing I did is I started leaching the soil, which means putting it in a, a basin of water and just letting the water run through the soil till the bubbles run out. The water was as brown as any dirty muddy, mud puddle you can imagine. Um, I had to leach that plant for weeks. And, um, but what I realized is that plant was doing its work and its job in that, in that woman's apartment. Um, she was, it, she, this plant was filtering the air and I'm happy to say it's been five years and the plant is back with my granddaughter and doing quite well. So odors be gone. And this is a much better way of, of eliminating odors in your home than um, an air purifier, um, an ugly air purifier that you might have to have in the, in the room. So these plants not only look beautiful, but they are functional too. And decorative. Um, here are two that are used in specific interior design applications. The one on the left, um, you'll notice is away from a source of light. Um, however, they have a grow light on it in the, um, I don't know if you can see this little, where's my, cur I don't have a cursor. Um, anyway, um, the, the little movie camera like on the right is providing it a, a source of light. 
Um, on the right, you'll see the banana plant and those plants can go out in the summer. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but that height of that plant um, and the magnificence of it really makes a, a, a dynamite statement in the home. And because it's placed in that area, um, it, gets, it gets all of the sunlight it needs and only needs you to provide the rest of its needs. When it comes to interior design, we're talking about form and function. Now on this left side, you see a, a black and white designed room. And the only color that they used to accentuate in the room was the green. And most of that was put there with the plants. And because of that um, very specific use of the greenery, they got a really pop of color and it brought that room alive. Imagine if you took that plant that's sitting on the ottoman out and said maybe threw a black and white um, throw over it just wouldn't be as as delicious looking as as this room is to me with the plant sitting there on the right i'm actually sharing an almost done um, project that i actually just completed the contractor showed up at our house today to start our own project um, but he just finished this master bath for me. And uh, originally that master bath had a full size double soaking tub that went across the window. Um, I took that tub out since nobody uses those double soaker tubs anymore. And we designed a bathing space, if you will, that has, um, it's all one area um, with a tub on the left and the shower on the right. There is no enclosure as you see typical showers because it doesn't need to be. It is all waterproof with the tile and the, and the curbless basin. But the important thing is, is how I use these flowers to actually provide privacy for the homeowners. Now, granted, they do live in the country and their neighbors are not right on top of them. Um, but, uh, and I've since added more plants to this location. But those plants are providing privacy for them and they are relishing all of the humidity that they receive um, from the bath, um, bathroom and, and the things that are going on in that room. But that garden room was specifically incorporated in there to give us that spa look and to take advantage of the, um, their love of nature. Flowering plants like the, the orchid I just showed you a, a little bit ago, um, they create elegance uh, with their form and their fragrance and, and color. So even, even African violets, some of them do have some fragrance. So when those blooms open, that's when um, a, a plant that's known to have a fragrance will emit their scent. Hanging baskets, um, another way to display in your windows. I always think of windows as like a canvas between the window treatments and how I can fit um, houseplants into them. You know, it, it becomes my own little picture. And then of course, linear elements like floor plants, as you see here with this areca palm on the right. Plants can even live in glass. Um, and actually, if you're looking for an easier way to care for houseplants, you might consider terrariums and, and um, other things like that. Here you see some apothecary jars that have been made in terrariums and then a wards case in the lower left-hand side. Those are great for, per, for plants that need a high humidity and they create their own um, environment, their own microclimate in there in which they, um, actually will continue to, it, plants perspire. That's how the, that's where our water leaves our plants. We take it in through the roots and then we release it through the leaves. So that releasing of the moisture actually creates moisture in that little bubble. And so it continues to, um, to water the soil mass and um, provide for it. And then the breakdown of the, the plants as some leaves die off and whatnot and fall down to the floor, they actually provide ex, ex, extra nutrients. Um, I have a terrarium that a client, not a client, well, she's a, she is a client, but she's also a good friend. And she was gifted one and she showed up at my door once and said, it's dying, can you take care of it? 
And uh, how many gardeners are out there that have that happen to them? I have a hunch if someone knows you're gardening, you get lots of plants to, to bring back to life. <laughs> um, anyway, I took it, I set it down in the hall table, which happened to be right next to a, a side light. And there it sat. I watered it two times in the next year. Um, it sat there for two years. They were over for dinner and I said, you know, it's healthy enough, you take that back. So they took it home. And three months later, it came back to me. It's dying. <laughs> well, you know, it's, I, I feel bad, but the, the, my friend is just such a nurturer that she just wants to take care of her plants. And the problem was that she was um, overwatering, watering too frequently. And also sometimes the plants give off a lot of moisture and you've got to crack the little little bit to let the moisture out, the humidity out, and she had failed to do that. So um, it's back here now and it's, it's under its, I think, third life, um, but we'll get it back. But again, if you do nothing, if you just leave it there and just water it a couple times a year, you're fine with terrariums, very easy to take care of. These, on the other hand, bonsai um, require a lot of work. They're basically miniature trees, oftentimes, and um, they are, their miniature size is created by the careful trimming of the roots and the branches and whatnot. Um, it's really a very scientific approach to, to raising plants, but people really um, enjoy the process of, of taking something that can grow to 60, 100 feet, and theirs is only 15 inches tall. So again, bonsai is um, another way to garden and to have houseplants that are uh, basically a, a decorative accessory, if you will, um, because of the, the stunning looks. And then you've got your edible houseplants. You've got your, um, your shoots and your herbs. Um, and uh, all of those are house plants that require some of your care, your care, but, you know, sprouts and grasses and herbs are, especially the fresh ones, really improve our, our recipes and whatnot. And to have them handy right in the kitchen or nearby um, is, is a wonderful thing. So let's move into nurturing those house plants. They don't have that many needs. They have um, they need light, and we've talked a lot about that already. They need to be um, at specific temperatures. They need water and nutrients. Now, the nutrients come in uh, the soil, and as the soil gets older and whatnot, and the plant continues to grow, it basically takes all the nutrients out of that soil, and then we'll need to add to that by um, by fertilizing the plant. But these are all that they need. If you can provide light, temperature, water, and nutrients, you are gonna have happy plants. Light is needed for the um, plant to produce food and survive. Um, but the amount of light that you get inside is dependent on things that are happening around you, such as trees outdoors, when they have um, their leaves on them, they may shade the inside at certain times of the day. Roof overhangs can um, cut down in the sunlight coming into the room. And of course, window curtains, the length of the day, we know that our days are shorter now, but getting longer again. Um, and the time of the day and the time of the year. In the winter, our sun is higher in the sky, which means that we're not getting as much and for as long. And then you, you add to that, um, bringing them inside um, where they're getting even less sunlight, you can see that you really have to um, be very careful with your light and make sure that they are getting ample light in order to survive. And as we mentioned earlier, before our program started, East is the best exposure for raising your house plants. So if you've got an Eastern exposure with windowsills or the ability, maybe glass doors down to the ground um, to put your, locate your house plants there, they're gonna be very happy. And that's because the, um, it's cooler from the East. Think about our sun is in the Southern sky, rises in the East early morning, 
and then um, sets in the afternoon in the west. So the east with a slant of, of south sun all the time is really the best one and it causes the least water loss from your plants. Southern and Western exposures inside the house are interchangeable for your plants. Um, in the winter time, if you can get them moved into a room with Southern exposure, um, it may keep some growing a little bit, but in the winter time, for the most part, most of our plants are dormant and not do really doing a lot of growing. So it's a time of rest for them, just like beers and, and other people that, that hibernate, um, the people that go to Florida and all that stuff. Um, but anyway, that's, that's how we, we, we go about that. Now, how do you know if your plant is getting enough light? Well, first you're gonna see that the inner nose, which is the area um, down at the bottom, I have a little sketch, in between the, um, the plant leaves are spaced a little bit, the stem is actually a little bit longer than, than the older part of the plant would be. Um, I think I can use, well, I can, I'll do it after um, when I come back to the screen. Um, one of the succulents has an example of the inner nodes being, um, being lengthened because it's not getting as much sunlight as it did in the summer months. Um, the new leaves might be smaller than the older leaves. And I don't mean just the ones at the tip, of course they're smaller, but as it, as it fleshes out and becomes a mature leaf, if it's still smaller than the older leaf, it's a sign that it's not getting enough light. And if the leaf color is really lighter green um, on the new foliage, as opposed to the older, that's, an, that's another sign. And of course, leaves can die when they don't get enough sun. Um, temperature is another important thing. Again, you know, going back to where these plants are native to um, really dictates the temperature that they can um, they can survive in. But the best temperature range for your indoor plants will be 70 to 80 degrees. Um, I don't think I could stay in a house of 80 degrees, but <laughs> your house plants could be could be okay there. Um, and at night, um, they like a period of rest. So 60 to 70, if you lower your thermostat at night, we do, um, it's fine for them to go down to 60 at night and they'll actually appreciate that change. Again, thinking of their native to being outside in nature and we have all of that happening every day, 24 seven. Um, rule of thumb, uh, for me is 45 degrees. Anything that is, if we're going to have nighttime temperatures of 45 degrees, or if our home is going to go down to 45 degrees, the house plants have to be moved. Relative humidity um, is part of the moisture and um, the watering aspect <clears throat> of plants. And uh, it's the amount of moisture that's contained in the air. And we know that it gets very dry in our homes in the, in the winter. Um, we can tell that from our skin and whatnot. And so again, these plants that come from tropical and subtropical areas, um, they're going to want as much, as much humidity as you can give them. So um, we usually are in the 20 to 40 percent humidity range um, inside during the winter. So anything you can do to increase humidity for your plants, they will be very grateful for. Um, and you can do that by simply just planting, placing your plants closer together huddling them together. They, again, they evaporate um, water from their leaves. So what they put out into the air, the, the nearby plants will, will pick it up. So consider plant putting your plants closer together to increase your humidity. You also can use a, a shallow water container and fill it with gravel or lava rock and then set your plants on top of the, um, the gravel. Do not set it in the gravel. Um, you want, you do not want your drainage wall, holes to come in contact with water all the time. But if you have water um, just under the pebble line, that humidity will, um, will help your plants. And then you can use a humidifier. Um, for a while there, I had like 45 orchids. I do not have those any longer. I have orchids, but not 45. And I was running a humidifier 24-7. Um, and I had a scary, a, a scary event happen. Um, we discovered the humidifier on fire 
um, in our dining room, which is where it was running. And probably when I added water, I must have spilled it on the electrical connection or something like that. But fortunately, we saw it. Fortunately, it was on a tile floor. And fortunately, we had a fire extinguisher around. Um, so I personally am not using humidifiers. That was enough to scare me. Um, but they, they do, if you're careful with them, they are a wonderful source for um, moisture. And then you can always spray around the plants, but remember that's gonna dry as quickly as you dry coming in and from out of, uh, out of the pool. So um, you can do it, but it's really not as effective as placing your plants together or using um, shallow trays. So when and how to water your plants. We need to think about the plant size, the plant type. Some plants do not require as much water as others. We talked about that earlier. Um, and some plants, the, the container isn't that large. So a large container would have, would have a need of more water when you're watering than a smaller container. Um, and we need to think about the volume of roots in the container um, versus the soil and the soil moisture. I mean, if the, if the soil is already moist, you do not need to add to it. Um, so it's that indoor environment that we're checking all the time. But if you've got a small plant in a four inch pot, um, you might need to add say a cup of water to that and that water will go right through and, and out the drainage holes. Whereas if you've got a Boston fern that is in a 15 inch pot, you may need two quarts of water to water that plant um, in order to satisfy its thirst. So the, the majority of problems in um, being unsuccessful with house plants is that people overwater them. And as I mentioned earlier, my friend, the nurturer, she's a great grandmother, great mom, great nurse even. Um, she is definitely one to, to nurture, um, but what overwatering or giving too much water to your plant is sure death for your plant. Um, you really do need to feel the soil and you've got to develop your own rhythm with your plants because sometimes they're in active growing uh, times and other times they're in a dormant mode. And when they're dormant, they do not take up as much water as when they're actively growing. So as much as some people don't like dirt, you do have to take that finger and you have to put it into the soil unless you'd like to use a water meter. I mean, a water meter will take your finger away, but if below the soil, the, the soil feels any moist at, at all, you do not want to water. Um, and I tend to be on a rhythm of about once a week. Once a week is when I think I've got to go and check all my plants. Now, not all of them are going to get watered that, that time. Some will be moist and I don't need to water. Others will be plenty thirsty and they're going to want water. In fact, they may be so dry that I want to go back and water them again. So get yourself into a routine, create your rhythm and regularly water. Don't wait for the sign to, for the plant to show you signs that it's thirsty and dehydrated. Um, do it regularly and keep them happy. But at the same time, do not keep any water in any saucers. If you've got protective saucers below your pots to catch water and to keep your surfaces dry, um, that is not the shallow pot to um, add humidity to the air unless you fill it with pebbles and move the pot above that. Um, because that water would actually, your roots would actually sit in that water. And like your fingers coming out of a pool that are all wrinkled and everything because it's taken up so much water, that would be what would happen to your plants. So we don't want that to happen. If you have water in your saucer, dump it out um, unless you think it's going to take it up very quickly. And then um, I mentioned earlier the house plant that had been in a smoker's home that I leached, um, that sometimes with um, fertilizing our plants, they leave behind soluble salts and that can be a little um, nasty to the roots and can burn them. So again, that leaching, just bringing them to a sink and letting water run through the pot and out the pot, um, will remove a lot of those minerals and um, restore your, your soil. And then moving on to feeding your plants. 
I find that while, while most people will water their plants and give, give light to their plants, they don't often think about fertilizing their plants. But that little plant in a pot is totally dependent on you. I think of the analogy of my, my little Shih Tzu dog, who he has a dog bowl and a bottle of water. If I didn't provide that to him, he wouldn't be able to get that. And you need to provide this for your plants. So you need to fertilize um, on a regular schedule. And again, the amount that you give your fertilizer and when you give your fertilizer um, is going to depend on the plant. The, the size of the pot and the light intensity that it's exposed to. Um, less is more when it comes to fertilizing and it is better to apply small amounts of fertilizer. Um, and if you don't fertilize, you're just not going to get good growth. Um, you need that as well as your light and your water. Um, during the winter, when your plant is a little more dormant, um, the light levels are reduced, you don't need to fertilize as much. In fact, I withhold fertilizing on, on house plants between the months of November and February. Um, I do not fertilize, I give them a good dose early October and I wake them up again um, the 1st of March with a good feeding. And then from there, I subscribe to the feeding once a month as opposed to feeding a little every time you water. You can do that every time you water, but I have a big hand and less is more, as I said. So it's really hard for me to get out like two grains of fertilizer um, to put in my pots. So I just do it once a week, once a month, excuse me. And uh, that works just fine. Again, you don't have to fertilize in the winter. They're sleeping, so they have no benefit to the plant. But now during the growing season, when, th when it starts to grow, that's when it's getting more light, it's get needing more moisture, and it needs its fertilizing applications increased. So, um, but you're only increasing it to a little every time or once a month with a regular thing. You, whatever you're using for your fertilizer, I, I use miracle Grow. There's lots of different fertilizers out there. Um, it should be a basic gentle 10, 10, 10, um, but follow the label directions for the quantity and, um, and don't over, over fertilize. It's not gonna make it grow huger because you gave it a lot of fertilizer. It's just gonna make it unhealthy. Soil is an important component um, for things to grow above that soil. We've got to keep what's below that soil healthy. So you can really use any good um, commercially made soil mix for your house plants. Um, if you'd like to make your own soil, um, that's very easy to accomplish with a mix of sand, peat moss, um, vermiculite. You know, again, you're increasing the um, the lightness of the soil so that it is not a mucky, hard soil. Um, you, you cannot use soil right out of the ground. You can't even do that with perennials and landscaping plants. Um, you do have to put in a, um, a, a, a mixture of, of peat moss and, and other things to um, improve the uptake of water and nutrients. So you want to go out and you want to buy a few house plants, um, and there's some lovely nurseries around um, that have them, and maybe you even have a few friends that have some some to spare. Um, but when you are out shopping, you want to start out with a very healthy looking plant. So look for plants that have a medium to dark green foliage, unless you know you're looking at a plant that say is has red leaves or chartreuse leaves, then of course, you know, that doesn't, doesn't fit. But a healthy plant would, um, would show that it's healthy with the medium to dark green foliage because it means it's been, it's gotten a lot of light and on a lot of nutrients. Also, you want to check the plant that you're considering on the other side 
um, of the foliage to look for pests, you know, like spider mites and uh, white fly and mealybugs. If you can avoid bringing them home in the first place, that is the best thing to do. Um, some clues for looking for um, pests on plants, especially if you're at the nursery, is look at that leaf, turn it upside down, but um, there's two types of pests, sucking pests and biting pests. Um, a spider mite is one of a sucking pest. So that's going to actually suck from, um, suck the leaf, the nutrients out of the leaf. Um, so you're gonna get this mottled, mottled, bleached out sort of, of leaf from a plant that is suffering from spider mites. Whereas a biting pest like a caterpillar um, or a slug, they're going to take a chunk right out of the leaf. Um, a disease would show up as brown spots, um, maybe some uh, yellowing of the leaves, <clears throat> but um, if you've got those mottled leaves or chunks out of it, then you've more likely got a pest than a disease. Now, I just want to caution on ferns. If you have any ferns as house plants, you will see on the underside of them um, growing up in a row, these, they look like little eyes, little dark brown spots. They are not bugs. They are not a disease. They are your spores, which are needed um, for fruiting. So ferns are another exception of um, not having what could be considered a pest, not being a pest. So you brought that healthy plant home, you put the one back that might have had any infestation, and now you want to keep them healthy. So it's as simple as providing those growth requirements. Again, if it's a tropical plant that grows um, in an understory, you, you know, doesn't need as much light as, say, that succulent that grows out in the desert. Um, you want to inspect regularly for insects and fungus. And, you know, that's really done every, every time you water and fertilize your plant. You're looking at them and, you know, you see a new leaf sprout out. You might see a new insect sprout out. Um, but try, treat your problems as soon as you see them. Um, and it will be, it will not be as difficult to control them. Keep your leaves clean and remove dust whenever you can. We have lots of new little things like dusters and whatnot that will do that. Um, but also that keeps your, the pores open in your plants and, and it's really, really a good thing to do. And then plants do grow. And when they grow, it, it's time to plant them up. Um, so at that time, you wanna consider repotting them when they, as they mature. So I wanted to show you some of the nuisances we have in growing house plants. And this looks horrible, but um, you will not experience all of these in your house plants. On the left, you see a leaf that has white fly. Uh, you know you have white fly if you go to water your plant and all of a sudden you see this like flurry of dust going up, like you just like you disturb dust. Those would be white flies. Um, and uh, we'll talk in the next screen, I think, about how to control them. But then you have aphids. Aphids tend to cling to the stem in the center there. Um, I wish I had a thingy. Um, aphids tend to cling to the stem and uh, they can be like a chameleon. So you gotta be careful with aphids. They can be green and they can be brown. Um, I like this, this little um, diagram because it shows you pests as well as diseases like the powdery mildew, um, the spots on the leaves, the rust on the leaves. So these are all different things that you should be looking for and trying to control. On the right here, I have an enlarged photo of a mealybug. Um, mealybugs only bother your plant if your plant is in stress. Um, and if your plant is in stress, Mealybugs will find its way to them and um, they're not prolific. There's not, you, I mean, a plant with mealybugs might have four or five on them. They can be hand picked off. Um, you don't want it to become a real issue and, and have more than that. They, they're not like aphids that they're all over or the white flies that fly up. 
Um, and they're easy to control with simply taking a Q-tip um, dipped into some rubbing alcohol. It's gonna break down that white fuzzy layer you see there and the bug itself is, is behind it and you can easily um, remove it. You don't have to touch it, your, your Q-tip can do that. Um, and then there's spider mites. If you see webs, spider webs in the nooks and crannies of your plants, it's a good, good um, indication that you do have spider mites. Um, they more or less make your plant look ugly, but they have to be a really huge infestation to really harm your plant. So, um, you know, again, if you, if you treat it, you can eliminate spider mites, but they're in your house anyway. You've probably seen them on your windowsills and whatnot. They're little, little, little tiny things, but, um, you know, we just have to learn to live with them sometimes. So if you do have plants, if you find plants that are sick, the first thing you wanna do is isolate them from others. So move them to another room um, where there are no other house plants, or if you gained some experience as, as I have over the years, um, you know that some plants are not prone to getting mealybugs. And so if a mealybug plant is in the room, you don't necessarily have to be that concerned because it doesn't like the other host plants that are around. But anyway, um, isolate it from other house plants so that they do not spread. If you've got aphids, spider mites, um, any other scale, um, mealybugs even, you want to spray it with a um, high spray, a high pressure spray of water to knock as many insects off as possible. And then you can use an insecticidal soap. Um, you can buy commercially made insecticidal soap, or you can make your own with a, a Dawn. Uh, it's about a teaspoon of Dawn to a quart of water. Um, mix that up and put it into a spray bottle and you can use that to treat your plants. <clears throat> this is an organic way to treat your plants. There are, other, there are some pesticides out there like um, Seven and Malathion. Um, if you have to use those, please read the labels on them and how to apply them. But um, I always try to go the organic way before I have to go the other way. And it almost 90% of the time takes care of my problems. So, um, and then after that spraying, you wanna repeat that process every two to four days for about two weeks. And the reason for that is they lay eggs and the eggs may not be washed off. They may actually hatch after you have treated and whatnot and could survive. So every two to four days for two weeks, you just wanna take and um, wash your plant off again and then spray it with the insecticidal soap and you will see that you will have controlled your infestation. So the plant has grown up and it's time to repot. And here you can see a plant that is prime for repotting. All of its roots have um, pretty much filled the pot that it was in. There is more root density there than there is soil density. And so it's time to move it up. And um, by that, you then have a little bit of work. I usually do repotting like twice a year, unless it's a certain plant. Um, but you only want, when you are ready to repot, you only want to go up one pot size. If it's in a four inch pot, you want to move it to a six inch pot. If it's in a 12 inch pot, you'll go up to a 14 inch pot. Um, and I say that because some, sometimes we have the thought, okay, it's a baby plant, but I know it's going to get big. So I'm going to put it in a big plant and then I'll only have to repot it one time. That's not going to work because all of that soil that is in the, the volume of soil that's in your container is going to hold too much water for your plants to survive. You need to have, you don't need to have that much soil um, and it's only a bad thing. You're just increasing the risk of mold and um, infestations by keeping that excess moisture around. If your plant is so large that um, you really need to divide it, and some plants every three years or so do need to do that, um, you can easily accomplish that by taking a, a knife and going right through the plant's roots and dividing it out and then separating each, each new individual plant 
into its own pots. Um, you want to trim out any old brown roots. They're not useful anymore. They're dead. You're, what we want are the white and the green roots that look very, very healthy. Um, shake off your excess soil. And be sure to choose a container that gives you adequate drainage. The water has to drain out of the pot. It cannot sit in the pot. Um, that is sure to um, overwater your plant. And after you have potted your plant, expect it to be in shock for a while. It may look a little wilted um, and a little sad, um, but that's okay if you've given if you've got it in a place of light source and whatnot, and you just nurture it. Um, in, in another week or two, it will rebound and you'll see new growth and you'll say, I just got another plant and I didn't have to pay $15 for it because it came from what I have. So another great thing for your plants, if you have the ability to do it, is to move your plants outside in the summer. Um, let nature take over. Let it get watered when it when it rains out. Let it uh, get sunny sun when it's sunny out. Let it have that increased air circulation. They go through a major growth period if you are able to give that to them. If you have to keep them inside during the summer, I mean that's okay. They're just not going to grow as quickly as as plants um, that you are able to bring outside. Protect them from wind and sun. So you wanna keep them like um, on a porch or um, even you know under trees and whatnot in some shade and water as needed. They will need more water in the summer months than they will in the winter months, especially outside because of that heat and whatnot, um, more water is going to um, evaporate and needs to be replenished more often. <clears throat> but this is a good thing. You can do it with a hose then, it's so easy. Um, increase your feeding times. Uh, again, if you're doing it um, as you go, um, that's fine. But again, this is a time where you really need to be on a schedule. So have that rhythm of making sure you're fertilizing um, according to whatever schedule you've developed. And then um, when it's time to come back inside, and again, I just watch the weather. Um, if the nighttime temps are gonna fall below 45, it's time to bring them inside. If I have a lot of plants, I will actually move them to my garage and I will fog them. I'll set them in the garage and I'll get a fogger and um, that will kill any creepy crawly insects that you may have that are might be in the soil and whatnot. But just inspect them for insects and uh, treat them if you find any before you bring them inside. I just give them a good clean up and, and just make sure they're all nicely tidy and whatnot before they come in. So let's get into looking for ways of um, creating some nice interiors using our houseplants. Here we have, um, on the left, you have a vertical garden of a planter that is filled with all sorts of delicious herbs. And on the right, you have this elevated tier, triple chair tray also has miniature pots of different herbs. And just imagine how great that is to just snip a couple uh, leaves of basil or thyme, whatever it is you're working on, some parsley, um, and um, have the fresh stuff right there. We just had to buy some parsley and it was a shame. I had to buy so much parsley for the little bit that I needed. Dish gardens, um, if you are interested in making your garden or making your pot container a work of art, you can consider combining plants. Just be sure you keep plants together that have the same light needs and water needs. Um, this one I actually created for a container outdoors this summer and loved it so much. And they are plants that will grow inside. Um, I'm overwintering it inside, but how pretty is this with the red oxalis and the pink polka dotted plant and the um, escargot begonia actually does have a little bit more burgundy than you have, but um, very, very lovely. And to just have that, it just brightens your days when you see things like that. Um, here you see succulents that are being raised indoors. Um, on the left are these, these pot heads, if you, if you will. Um, both have succulents growing. There's a Ripsalis cactus in the taller uh, woman's head. 
and I can't remember what the other succulent is. I went around this morning and took some pictures of my house plants so that I could show you how to arrange them. You'll notice they're all in light sources, but they also have some decorative containers um, as well. So it's, it's, um, it's a pretty, pretty aspect. Uh, and here we have a picture of a hanging garden. And this is actually um, here in our kitchen window and it's all air plants. Air plants are so easy to take care of. All you have to do is, get, is let them have a little bit of water every two weeks. Um, I don't know if you see the Spanish moth that's hanging in the window. Um, I got that at a flower show several years ago and that, that Spanish moss that we see all over down south, um, you can grow inside. And um, I've been having fun with it every once in a while, it'll fall off and, and I just keep plucking it back in. Um, but anyway, this, these um, I just used a little tension rod between the cabinets and then um, S hooks to suspend the the little orbs and all of these air plants, all I do is drop them in the sink every couple of weeks, let them soak for 15 minutes, shake them out, put them back in their thing. It's very handy and um, well, it's, um, I like it better than window treatment. Uh, here I have a picture of a plant that's been used in a dark corner but it's kind of a necessary thing that really adds a lot to that corner and really brings into focus a little writing area there. Um, and you can do that. You just have to um, consider how you're going to light it artificially. So first start by choosing a low light plant. And there are many of them that can grow this large, like Diefenbachias and um, philodendrums and whatnot. Um, and then use a, a, a light that you have on a timer. Our ficus plant that we bought 41 years ago um, actually has a, a timer with a light on it and I give it six hours of light every day in the winter. Um, and even though it's in a window, I just couldn't get it into a, a window that, that was bright enough for its needs. So I supplement it with artificial lighting. So you can still have dark corners as long as you light it up. We talked about grouping plants together for increasing humidity. And here you can see um, plants that are clustered together in front of a window. And, and it really becomes a, a wonderful decorative statement to have all of that nature right in front of you. When you are setting them out for display, vary the height for visual interest. You don't want anything to be too flat. So think about short, mid height, tall, and same with the containers. You see that they went outwards as much as they went upwards. So um, again, vary those heights for that interest. Another look at terrariums and how pretty they can be. Um, and again, we talked about them not being a lot of care once you, once you have gotten them established, but they're great for moisture loving plants like this lady slipper dorpit. And then you can also show off your roots. So um, I like all parts of a plant. I'm just really crazy about plants. So if you want to see what's the mystery is growing below um, as much as you enjoy seeing what's growing above, you can actually plant them in, in vessels so that you can see that. And there are certain plants that are will adapt to growing in water um, better than others. And it usually is plants that require a lot of water, like that peace lily is a perfect one for um, growing in, in water only. Look how pretty this living room is with the vertical garden. They chose some decorative hanging containers and filled it with low light plants like the Phalaenopsis um, orchids and the ferns um, as well as some um, uh, spider plant. But this takes the place of art and, um, and it's cleaning your air and removing odors at the same time. I mean, what's not to love about them? Vertical gardening is really enjoying um, some popularity right now, especially because new systems are being developed to um, to maintain them. You know, you 
something like this, you have to think about holding the plants back. Um, what is their soil and moisture? How are we going to add moisture to it, especially when it's inside? You're not going to take a hose and just spray it down in your living room. Uh, but they have developed lots of systems that make this possible. Um, maybe you've been to the Berkshire Botanical Gardens Education Center. They have two beautiful vertical garden walls there. Um, and I'm working on one of that bathroom that I showed you earlier that had the garden window in it. Um, I'm putting, I'm putting a, another vertical garden on the wall in that bathroom. I grow plants for many reasons, to please my soul, to challenge the elements, or to challenge my patients for novelty or for nostalgia, but mostly for the joy of seeing them grow, said David Hobson. And that concludes our talk. And um, here I've just got information on how you can reach out to us. Um, you can call our cooperative extension um, hotline, Master Gardeners, mind that, um, three days a week. And we will do our best to answer your questions. And you also can go to our website um, and also Cornell's website. And for me, every talk that I do, I have a um, coordinating board on Pinterest. So if you're looking for ideas, plants to use, ways to display them, um, how to deal with um, pests and whatnot, you can go to um, find me on Pinterest, search for Garden Gem, and I have like 30 boards out there, but this one would be marked houseplants um, for this particular talk. So have we got any questions? I guess you can unmute yourself, guys. Yes. Yeah. If you have a question, just feel that you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hopefully, hopefully that would work. Uh, anything in the chat box, Carolyn? Uh, oh, just they just thank you, thank you, just thank yous. Jennifer's got a question. Yes, um, my exposure indoors is. Um, 95% west. What kind of a plant would you recommend for that? Well, that's a good exposure. It's not the best, but it's a good exposure. Okay. Um, east, as we said, is the best, but yeah. you can basically grow anything that is a, a low light to mid light plant. So plants that require more light again are your succulents. Um, going back to where they're native to, if you, um, um, if you're looking for plants to grow in the West, you're going to be looking at plants that were original in a tropical zone, like orchids. I mean, anything, ivies, uh, ferns, um, right. air plants, <laughs> you know, just about anything can grow there. Okay, can I ask another question? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, what what kind of a potting soil would you would you recommend? And also, I'm asking specifically because um, one time I repotted a plant, and the soil had must have had white flies in it, and it just I had an infestation of white flies, which I got rid of by basically um, not watering the plant for weeks and they just died off. But I also at the time read somewhere that um, there are some places that I guess meant or package potting soil that um, just can't control the white flies in their environment. And so it's being sold with, with, that, with those eggs inside the potting soil. Um, Jennifer, I just wonder if it was in fact white fly or could it possibly have been fungus gnat? Um, when a soil... Okay, Go I ahead. don't know. I, it, okay. they, they crawled around in the soil. Okay, um, I asked that because if a, if a plant is stressed and if you notice that it's taking a long time to dry out in between waterings, um, chances are fungus gnats have settled in there because of the moisture. And I can tell them easily when I, you know, if I just take my finger and go across the soil and I th see things move, um, they're fungus gnats. And yes, they do fly. Um, 
The way to take care of them is, I, I use an old fashioned um, method of that. I, and I have to go find somebody that smokes cigarettes. Um, but you take a cigarette and you, uh, you soak it in water overnight and then you water it with a nicotine. Um, the only other way you can eliminate those fungus gnats would be to um, totally replace the soil. You may have gotten a soil that was very, very wet and the fungus gnats were there, but they can be, um, they can be, the soil can be dried out and they will, they will move away if it's, if it's, if the soil is dry. Okay. I guess that's what they were then, but I definitely didn't have the problem until I repotted it. So it must have been in the soil that I purchased. Oh yeah, yeah, it could very, very well be. And you know, the problem with uh, commercially grown soil is none of it is is certified or licensed. I mean, there's not very many controls on what you are getting. Um, that's why I tend to stick with brand names um, when I'm getting it because I know that they're gonna use controls in um, you know the, the materials that they put together to develop that soil. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Denise, you see there's a couple of questions in the chat. There's uh, what are the best beginner plants? Best beginner plants are going to be spider plants, the peace lily plant that I showed you earlier that my granddaughter's working with. Um, okay. Even, even you know, the Spelinopsis fern, um, orchids that you can get into the grocery store are very easy. They do not, they require indirect light and um, just water them when they start to dry. Um, orchids will put out a flower spike once or twice a year, but they're very easy to take care of um, otherwise. So anything that's more common, like your mother's ears, your pothos, philodendrons, um, I think the ones that are a little more touchy would be like begonias and succulents only because they need so much sun and they just get leggy. Um, so hopefully that'll answer your question. And then um, how much light do you recommend with a terrarium plant? And are these usually lower light level plants in a terrarium? Yes, uh, good question. Excellent question. Terrariums should not be placed too, too close to the sun. Uh, they need to be moved away from the glass or maybe even said, I, I, I don't have one right now, but I'm in the midst of getting things together after the holidays. Um, uh, the terrariums can just sit off of the window. Um, just they want brightness, but they don't need direct sun. Um, and that if they do get too much sun, Again, the water will evaporate in their leaves and they'll overwater themselves by producing that um, cascading waterfall effect, if you will. Did then, that answer? Uh, I only have northern exposure. What do you recommend for low light plants or for a grow light? A grow light will definitely help you. If you can, um, and the grow lights can be anything, um, you know, you just want to. I think it's best to use a light on a timer so that you make sure that you give it adequate light and don't have to think about turning it on and turning it off. Um, but if you have a northern exposure, and I have a lot of windows on a northern exposure, I do place plants there, um, like our Boston ferns. Those don't require as much sun. They're a sh more of a shade plant. Um, and I put big decorative plants in, in these northern exposures. Um, anything that requires indirect or um, low light. Again, uh, your areca palms would be ones that, that do not require as much brightness. Um, so they would be grow well in that exposure too. Um, I have three questions if I could ask them. Sure. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the vertical gardens that you show it on the wall. How, how did they hang? The, <laughs> I, I have one right here in my kitchen. Um, they actually um, have a box behind the frame and um, mine has a wire on it. So um, the frame clips onto the box. Now you wonder in the front where the um, actual plants are coming out of the soil 
um, there is a liner of cocoa liner on mine. Um, I use a cocoa liner over, you know, and I kind of like put an X in the cocoa liner, plant my succulent in there or my, my herb, and um, that will keep the, the soil from falling forward. And most of these planters um, actually have a slant in them so that they, they, the soil does not fall out. And you water from above. Like I took mine down yesterday and watered. I actually brought it over to the sink and laid it down and sprayed it and, and let it drain. And I take it out in the summer and it becomes my front door wreath, if you will. <laughs> okay. Um I have a small apartment and the, the window is like not it's hard to explain, but then I also have like a breakfast bar, which is probably the best place, but then I won't get light. And I also have a cat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so like I had got a succulent, but now I realized that I probably overwatered it and it wasn't near sun. Um, mm -hmm. It's sounding like maybe the peace um, lily would be something to try on like the breakfast bar. I'm just concerned about sun. But I guess I could How far away from the window is your breakfast bar? It's like the windows here and then the breakfast bar is like by the kitchen. So the windows is like the living room and it's small. Like 10 feet apart? It's, uh, it's hard to explain, but I don't think mm -hmm. it's anywhere near the window. I will, I will tell you though that I um, grew for years a peace lily in my office when I worked in corporate America. Um, it actually was, it was a little joke. Uh, every time it threw a flower, one of the people that um, I was a manager would come to me and tell me they're pregnant. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, they don't require a lot of, a lot of um, sunlight. And so you could probably grow that across a room, but really the closer you can get it to a window, the better, even if you can set up a table in front of your window, that would be the best. The only thing I can think of that can grow across a room like that is bamboo. Bamboo would do it. And maybe the mother-in-law's tongue, the Sansevieria. Yeah. Cause I just have to consider my cat too. <laughs> uh, well, they would not bother a Sansevieria, I do not think. Um, and I don't think a bamboo, I don't think they, that's too, too um, tough for them to, to bother. Um, I don't know, every cat is different. I mean, we have a cat here too, but she doesn't bother any of our plants. So, okay. but I know that I'm lucky, um, yeah. <laughs> the last thing, that, um, I don't know how much to get into this, but I have a Christmas cactus that has bloomed and I've had it at work in a window that is dark at night and it gets cold. But I brought it home with the things going on with working from home and all of that. And um, it didn't bloom for Christmas. But I'm also wondering if it needs to be repotted. Um, and I've heard different things about soil and when you feed it. And it just seems very complicated for a Christmas cat. Well, um, you know, I have a lot of Christmas cactuses and I got to tell you, they bloom all of all times of the year because one of the secrets of getting a, a cactus to bloom is to let it have a dormant period, um, maybe about a month where you don't water it at all. And then you take it out and you bring it to a light source and you start watering it again. Um, and it and it should flower. They're very easy to, to care for. Um, again, keep it a little dry in between, let it dry out in between watering. Um, if you want to force it into flower, um, just withhold water for a month and then just start watering it again. You will, you will get, you it's should get It's always bloomed at Christmas and like around Easter. It's just this year it didn't bloom at Christmas. And I think it is like possible that with taking it from your um, work environment and bringing it home, yeah. it's very possible that it just had a little bit of a shock and it just threw its rhythm off for this year alone. And it will probably you know, um, flower for you next time. It just said, I didn't like that, but you know, I know you had to do what you had to do, but <laughs> it didn't die completely. So I, I'll bet you it will flower for you again. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other I, question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, what, uh, where's a good place to purchase plants um, this time of year? 
Well, I don't like to give referrals to one place when another place will be annoyed because I'm a I, I go to them all. But I do know for that garden window, um, I went to Fatigans for for those plants. I know that they do a very good job of of um, caring for their plants. I also think George's is a good spot for them, and we have the. Um, um, Oh, what's a nursery just up above Hudson Valley? What's that nursery? Oh, Hewitt? Uh, not Hewitt's, but Hewitt's is okay. Hewitt's is okay. Again, you know, all of them could get infestations just like we get them in our home. So I, I'm not, you know, really hard on them if I find that, you know, I brought a spider mill ant home, but, you know, they, you know, most of them do take good care of their plants. Um, and, um, you know, it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for something that is a little more unique, you'll probably find it at a higher end nursery than a lower end nursery. You tend to get the vanilla and chocolate in um, the usual nurseries like your Home Depot and your Walmarts and things um, like that. I'm near Hudson Valley and um, someone put in the chat Yonder Farms. That's the one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and there's Becker's over in North Greenbush. Um, that's yeah. another another great place for house plants. Any other questions? Well, I think I've taken a lot more time than I was supposed to, but I'm really glad um, that you all came out to learn about house plants and I wish you a happy growing season. And um, if I could give a little promotion to our spring garden day, the master gardeners are very busy um, working together a virtual program um, of our spring garden day. We're gonna have a uh, speaker from Cape Cod. She's a well-known author speaking on cocktail gardening uh, we also, the theme of it is mind, body, and spirit, and we'll be, you know, doing things. We have lots of door prizes, and um, we're going to have a wonderful digital swag bag filled with all sorts of discounts for local nurseries and, and um, like businesses in the gardening arena. So that's going to be, I believe it's March 11th. Um, we're just doing our mailing this week. So I would say stay tuned. Um, and you can also go and um, check out our website, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County, and it will be up on there. Pardon? Perfect. Oh, I've been corrected by my husband. The date is March 13th. Um, it's Saturday morning and it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to make it fun. Thanks so much, Denise. You always do such a nice job. We appreciate it. Thank you, Carolyn. Thanks, everybody. Night now. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone, you. for coming. Have a nice night. And we are going to put it up on YouTube if you want to check back. Thank you. I'll talk to you later, Carolyn. Good to talk to you, Denise. If you have any other ideas, you know we're always we're always looking. <laughs> um, I am working on some with Cornell, um, but I will tell you the succulents, the terrarium one is a good one. Okay. And I yeah, am doing. I mean, we had a lot of questions about terrariums tonight, so I think yeah, that something like that. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. I could demonstrate how to how to build a terrarium. Oh wow. Yeah. Oh good. Okay. So that might be one of interest. Um, and then I'd have to look at the list, but those are just some that are jumped out that are good for being at home and working at home. Right, right. I have a plant uh, now that everybody has, but it's gotten like really leggy. It's gotten really leggy. It's like yeah. all, the, all the leaves closer have died and then all the leaves at the end are alive. Is there anything I can do to- Cut it back by about a third. What type of plant is it, do you know? It's got, um, it's it has little pink dots on the leaves, it's, but it's a small leaf. Oh, it's a polka dot plant like that. I think I showed it to you earlier. 
Yeah, uh, but the leaves, aren't, the leaves aren't as big. It's a, it's a relatively small. I don't know, maybe because it's in a small okay. container. No, yeah, uh, um, but yes, that is the, yeah, that you actually can trim that back to, um, that was that inner node thing that I was talking about. Right, because yeah. It's gotten big. So cut it back to um, below the lower inner node. And that should um, okay because because I'm I was afraid to cut it back because there'll be no leaves left. I wouldn't cut every stem back because you do need some leaves to photosynthesize. Um, right. But take some stems. I had to do it from one that I brought in this summer. I got very I, I just ignored it and the leaves fell off on the stem. So, uh, but by you cutting that stem down, it will branch out, put put more branching out, and become okay. full of as well but don't do all of them at once do a couple of them and um, okay. don't take it all the way down to the root ball i mean you can it will rejuvenate but that's a pretty hardy plant that one requires a little bit more moisture than most plants but okay. other than that it doesn't need sun and you should be good thank you denise all and right. i'll be in touch okay sounds good bye all right thanks have a nice night